that we're going to start reading and learning the Rambam's rules about the king, right? It's, there are mitzvahs, 613 commandments in the Torah. Remember, the word commandment is not a good translation. The word mitzvah comes from the root to come close and unite as, right? If we're talking about God's commandments to us, it's a way we commune with Hashem, we connect with Hashem, we have a relationship with Hashem through the mitzvot. Some of them are just for us, so, right? And there's many different types of us, right? Some are women, some are men, some are farmers, some are firemen, some are cowboys, right? Policemen, judges, uh, some of us are kings. So there's going to be a mitzvah that applies just to whoever is selected and anointed mm -hmm. as king. And some of it will be on us and how we appoint or anoint a king. So this is going to develop into who the Messiah is or defining who the Messiah should be, yeah. his role and the commandments that are coming upon the Jewish king. Okay? Because the word Mashiach comes from the root of to anoint. Mm -hmm. It means to anoint. And there are many people who are anointed. Mm -hmm. There's the Kohen, he's anointed, the Kohanim, right? The high priest and the priests. And you have um, kings. Okay? Mm -hmm. So they're anointed. That's why they're called Mashiach. The Jewish concept of Mashiach has nothing to do with a personal savior. We'll find out what the Torah has to say. And uh, we all have to live by the Torah. So we'll, we'll see what the Torah has to say. And we're using the Rambam to explain the Torah. His book is called The Mishnah Torah. And he, with a fine tooth comb, goes through the, the Gemara, right? The Talmud, the Oral Torah. And it goes back, of course, to the written Torah. So let's find out what he has to say. So the first halacha he brings down, believe it or not, there are three commandments. Shalosh mitzvot nitztavu Yisrael b'shat k'nisatan la'aretz. Israel was commanded to, to fulfill three mitzvahs when we enter the land. One is to choose a king, to choose a king, to appoint a king. The verse says in Deuteronomy, if you want to write it down, you want notes, it says in Deuteronomy 17.15, Som Tasim, it's on double, you shall surely, it's a command, you shall surely place upon yourself a lecha melech. Okay, you have an obligation. Now, is it a personal obligation or is it a communal obligation? Tell me, what do you think? Can I appoint me a king and you appoint yourself a king? Or do we all have to get together or somebody like the Sanhedrin perhaps, mm -hmm. perhaps appoint a king? That's Deuteronomy 17, 15. Another command the Rambam brings down when we come into the land of Israel is to destroy a nation called Amalek. You heard of those bad people? They're bad people. And it says in Deuteronomy 25.19, it says, Timche et zeche amalek, to wipe out, erase the remembrance or the memory of a nation called Amalek. I have to tell you the truth. We don't know who they are today. We do have an idea, but it's probably not correct because more likely they are tri transmigration of souls reincarnated into different nations. Every generation we find people that hate us. But they do have certain characteristics. And it could be, you know, through these trans transmigration of souls. I know we have someone who here is German. So 70 years ago or 80 years ago, up until even today, many of us think that Germany or parts of Germany or perhaps just the Nazis embellished the character traits of a Malik. That's easy to swallow, correct? Some of us think that through the transmigration of souls, perhaps our, some of our present day enemies are a Malik. But because we have no clear proof, you cannot fulfill this mitzvah without the prophet Elijah to let us know who is who, okay? So we'll put on the back shelf, but we'll, historically speaking, we're gonna learn a lot and uh, 
So maybe, perhaps, there's no way to really fulfill it in its uh, fullness of wiping out and killing man, woman, and child from that particular nation, because we don't know who the nations are. But I will lead on to another idea, and that is that uh, according to an opinion that the ten tribes are supposed to come back, you know about this idea? We're hoping and praying every day that they return. There's an opinion that says only when all the nations return back to their original places, then you'll know who the ten tribes are, because guess where they're going to end up? Right here in our laps. Baruch Hashem, Ezrat Hashem, who knows what. But in the meantime, we see in modern age, in my opinion, because I do watch or hear the news, there's a major migration um, shift going on throughout the world. It's not just America that's dealing with immigration. Baruch Hashem also, Israel, has its own immigration issues with who is a Jew, who's not a Jew, uh, who's from Sudan, right? Who needs asylum? Who doesn't need asylum? But throughout Europe, throughout the Middle East, mm -hmm. I don't know what's happening in China. I don't know if you guys have any type of immigration issues. I'm sure a lot of people would like to leave China, maybe. Um, I know, I know you, North Korea, they would like to leave. You say some foreigners want to live in China. I'm asking the question. Yes, I, I heard some some more they want to go to China because the food is very delicious and the price is very cheap and the rent all, all seems very, not very affordable. expensive. It's affordable. It's very cheaper than okay. in Israel. So let's, the, the so, let's, so let's take what I'm saying. It doesn't matter the reason. We don't always know the reason, but when there is this migration going on, that there must be God's hand behind it, right? We look around the world, we always think God is behind everything. So even if someone is only seeking asylum in, a foreign, in another country, or they're going for economic reasons, yeah. it doesn't matter their reason. The fact is they go to, from country A to country B, and that's all you need to know, okay? And where they end up, that's anybody's guess. Guess what the third commandment that the, the Rambam brings down? And that is to build a house for God. Now you may ask, we didn't build it when we first came into the land. We had, we had the tent, we had the tabernacle. I think she needs your help. Okay, you're gonna put I'm that sorry, down on the ground. You want to sit here? No, 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 she's gonna put it on the ground, okay. Um, and that is, live note Beit Habachira, to build a chosen house as it says, and we're going to see more than one verse, but the Rambam brings down Deuteronomy 12, chapter 12, verse 5. Seek out his presence and go there. It's amazing. We think about the base of Mikdash. God says, if you want a relationship with me, if you want a relationship with God, Yosh. listen to the words. L'shichno tidrash tidrashu ubatashama. Seek out his presence and go there. Here. Well, we're talking about 1,500 meters in that direction, yeah. uh, specifically the Temple Mount. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we want a relationship with God, we have to build him a house. So we had a tent. I mean, I don't want to belittle it and call it a tent. It was the tabernacle, but it was like Legos. You could take it apart and it moved, right? You transport it and then you rebuild it. Um, but it's not the same as a house, which was the first temple, the second temple, and there's a prophecy about a third temple in Ezekiel. It's not the only place it's talked about, yeah. but uh, in detail, in detail it is spoken about, and that's the most amazing thing. Mm -hmm. And that temple does not match, it matches neither the first nor the second. Okay. The second halacha says... The appointment of a king, he's going to actually tell us the order, as if there needs to be an order, right? Is there, why should we think there's any order? You have these are um, commandments upon the people, so let it happen. Let the, you know, pick up sticks, let, let it just, wherever it falls, whatever it happens. No, he tells us there's actually an order. So the first thing he says is, the first thing you do, you need to appoint the king before you go to war against the Malik. 
And how do we know? Because it says in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, we see that when uh, Samuel appoints King Saul, he, he commands him, he, appoint, he, um, he gives him a charge. And he says, this is what it says, God sent me to anoint you as king, now go and smite Amalek. These are the prophet's words. He appoints Saul, now that I appointed you a king, go and smite Amalek. So from here, remember, the, something about the prophets we should understand. The prophets are really the oral Torah. The oral Torah. The written Torah was given letter for letter by God to Moses. Wow. Undisputable. There's no change. It is solid, concrete. It's sturdy. I'm not going to say that the prophets are less sturdy, but the prophecy that Moses had was the clearest vision any prophet could ever have and was told literally what letters to write. The prophets saw through a vision that was not crystal clear. It wasn't crystal clear. It was opaque. It was like looking through a telescope. You have one glass after another, a mirror, a lens, and ultimately they had a vision. And on their own, they describe the vision. It's a big difference between God saying to you, write this letter, now write that letter, now write down like a space, right? Word for word, letter for letter. But they describe the vision that they saw. There's another law that a, a prophet, nobody is allowed to add to the Torah. So whatever the prophets are telling you, it's something that you must already know. Because the main role of the prophet is to rebuke the people. Okay, if we were doing great, fine, doing everything we're supposed to do, we wouldn't need the prophet to come and tell us, get your act together. Okay, when you have a, if, if a prophet comes and tells you a prophecy, and it does not come to pass, right, what does the Torah say? How do you know a false prophet? Because he tells you something that's going to come to, not, and it doesn't come to pass, he's a false prophet, you put him to death. Now, let me ask you something, is that true in every case? A prophet says, this is going to happen, and then it doesn't happen. Is he a false prophet, prophet automatically? You nod. Yes. What about you? Okay, you're thinking. And you say yes. It would make sense. But I'm going to tell you, you're sitting, you have to put on your seatbelts. Only when the prophet tells you something good is going to happen and it doesn't happen, then he's a false prophet. Why? Yeah. Because if he tells you something bad's going to happen and it doesn't happen, he's not a false prophet. He is telling you to change your ways. And if you don't change your ways, this bad thing's going to happen. And then it doesn't happen, so what do we assume? That they listen to the prophet and they change their ways. He comes to warn the people to change. And if you don't change, this is what's going to happen. So how many people does it take? To, how many Jews does it take to change a life? Or how many people does it make be to make a change for the disaster, not the, the prophet of doom, not to take place. I'll tell you, we don't know, only God knows. He only knows the hearts. It could have been one person, it could have been the whole people just moved one centimeter in the right direction. Could have been enough to stave off a disaster. So if a prophet comes and tells this negative thing, right, you guys are doing this, that, and the other thing, and this is gonna happen, and then it doesn't happen, what is our assumption, what do we know? that it didn't have to happen, never had to happen, and most likely it was a change, obviously, in the people's behavior and thoughts, and that's why. So now we know a little bit more about prophecy. So we're going to be learning a lot about the, the, the prophets. I just wanted to get this as a foundation. Prophecy is, they, you know, if you warn somebody, you're not giving them, right? You're not allowed to add to the Torah, right? The prophets never revealed anything that already wasn't established in the five books. The people are living a Jewish lifestyle, Torah and Mitzvahs, and then something happens, so the prophet is coming to warn them. You get a warning on something that you know about, right? You're just not behaving properly, so that's warning number one, then warning number two. You get pulled over by the police. You can't say, I didn't know. You got a license, they give you a test, you know what the sign meant, so you say, I didn't see it. <laughs> I didn't see the sign. It's not that you didn't know the law. 
but you weren't aware of everything. So, okay, so that's what the prophets do. And uh, we're going to see a lot of revelation through the prophets, but don't think of it as a brand new revelation, but think of it as a way of speaking to the people about something they already know. It has to be that way. They're revealing something to the people that they already know, but need to strengthen themselves, hear it in another language, another way that they're not, they weren't, might not have been familiar with, but it can't be new. It's forbidden, it says in the Torah. Right? If a prophet comes and tells you about something your forefathers did not know about, chuck him out. He ain't a prophet, or he's a false prophet. So with the first thing we see that in, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, that Samuel says to King Saul, God sent me to appoint you as a king. O Tishlach Hashem Lim Shachecha, Lim Shachecha, to make you the Mashiach. Lamelech, to make you Mashiach, right? Melech HaMashiach, to make you the anointed one to be a king. Oto Lech, now go, Vihikita et Amalek, go and wipe out Amalek. Okay. Now, Amalek's seed should be annihilated before the construction of the temple. Now, we don't see them being totally annihilated, but close to it. If you look in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, it actually says, So what did, um, David is having a conversation with Nathan the prophet, and it says, and it came to pass, when the king dwelled in the palace, this is King David, he's dwelling in a real solid stone, maybe Jerusalem stone, similar to a house that you live in. Um, the king is living in his palace. God gave him peace from all his enemies who surrounded him. And the king said to Nathan, to the prophet, look, I'm dwelling in a house of cedar, right? A real sturdy home, but the ark of God dwells within curtains. I said before about a tent, not exactly a tent, but it is a tent, that David felt, I have it better off than God. Now, does God need a house? Really, truly. Mm -hmm. We call him Hamakom, omnipresent, he's everywhere. The world, he's in the world. The whole world is within him. So we'll have to discuss what exactly is the role of the temple, okay? For man and not God. That's for sure. That's for sure. So we see here also that there is an order. So you anoint the king before you wipe, try to wipe out a malek, and then you have to wipe out a malek, or at least a good portion of them, before building the house. Since it's a mitzvah to appoint a king, what is going to be our question? We have to ask, why was God or even Samuel, displeased with the response, with, with the request to anoint a king. Especially since the Rambam says, as soon as you come into the land, you, this mitzvah is incumbent. But they didn't. How, how many years must have passed? King David lived approximately 400 years after we came into the land. Correct? A little more than that, but okay. So why for 400 years didn't we ask before? And when we finally do ask, there's a criticism. And how do I know there was a criticism? If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, it says, it is not you, but me they have rejected. Meaning God says to Samuel, this whole thing, request for a king is, does not, is not the best option here. It's not, it's not the first option, it's not the best option. So it is not you, Samuel, that has to be despondent or hurt or personally taken affront by, but me they have rejected, God says. So let me just read it in Hebrew, because this was a beautiful Hebrew way of explaining it. 
Me'achash Achamat Melech Mitzvah. After they, after they uh, wanted to do the, the, um, the appointment of a king. Lama lo rotza kadosh baruch hu kishashalu melech mishmul. Why was God not satisfied? Why was He not pleased by the fact that they asked for a king from Samuel? Lefishashalu bitrom bit bitaromet because they asked in a complaining way. Now that's the Rambam's language. What, what what were they complaining about? Some of the words they used were, "We want to be like everyone else." We want to be in Eurovision. We want to be in the World Cup. We want to be, I don't know, I can come up with a few other, but I don't really know that much about the world. Uh, but I know what's, uh, what I read in the newspapers, which I don't buy. But anyway, uh, they asked, they made the request in a spirit of complaint. Bitaromet. Velo sha'alu l'kai mitzvah. They didn't say, we want to fill the mitzvah. Remember, the whole idea behind mitzvahs is to come close to God, to have a relationship with God. If they would say, we want to come closer to God, we want to do mitzvahs, and one of the 613 mitzvahs is to have a king, so let's do it. That's not called a complaint. That would have been perfect and no problem whatsoever, whether in God's eyes or Samuel's eyes. But that's not what they did, and that's what they said, and that's, what that, that's not what they meant, apparently. Ele b'vnei shekotsu b'shmuel hanavi. It sounds like they were a little bit disgusted or rejecting Samuel. Samuel was the leader, so he was a prophet. But, you know, take the prophet and say, you know, it's not good enough. We want a king. That's basically what they were saying. And that's why God responds, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. <laughs> they didn't ask to do mitzvahs. And uh, so we read the verse in 1 Samuel 8, 7, which says, it's not you they, they discussed or despise. God says it's me. Okay, the third halacha, king may only be anoint, appointed by a court of 71 elders. The king must be. Obviously, we've had many kings that were not. The question is why? How does it work? I'll tell you real quick that once the king's appointed, his son doesn't need to be appointed. His son will automatically become king. So you don't need an appointment by the next generation. But it's not always the son. Okay? We didn't have it by the Hasmonean kingdom, right? Or after that. Okay, so a king may only be appointed by the court, that's the Sanhedrin, of 71 elders. I mean, the best way, you don't initially anoint a king, appoint a king. By the, he said, it's translated in English, 71. There really were 71. You had the 70 Sanhedrin, and you had a leader of the Sanhedrin, like the Av Beitin, the head of the court. And through a prophet. So it's not just it's not just the Sanhedrin, but it's also the prophet, a prophet. So we're looking forward to Elijah the prophet, who will let us know. Just like Joshua was appointed by Moses, and Moses is based in, meaning Moses' court was involved. It wasn't just Moses that made the decision. And just like Shaul, King Saul, and King David. So that was not father to son, so you did need the Sanhedrin uh, and the prophet for both Saul, Saul, Shaul, and David. Shemimam Shmuel Haramasi Ubeistino. That Shmuel, the prophet from remote, which is not far from here, and his Beistin anointed both King Saul when he was anointed and David when he was anointed. You wouldn't need that for Solid. Okay, this may be surprising to somebody, but we'll have to see anything that's written here. You have to find and ask, what's the, where does it say in the Torah? That a king should not be appointed from... So your, your question is what? Your original question about the converting. How do you know, how, how does one know who is a convert? Mm -hmm. So... The Jewish people are extremely particular about ichus, ichus, um, 
that's uh, genealogy. Who's from who? Right? Kohanim can't just marry anyone. A mamzer, someone who was born from a forbidden relationship, can only marry another mamzer. There are certain nations that we're not allowed to marry at all. We're going to talk about the, the kingdom of Moab, that actually we were allowed to marry their female converts, but their male converts were never allowed in to the mm-hmm. congregation. Yeah. Okay? So you have to know. And believe it or not, the Jewish people are a great experiment. When genealogists want to get together and figure out what's, what's going on, they use the Jewish people because we actually have many records. And if someone wants to make Aliyah today, they have to come and dish up their records. Who are you? Where are you from? Where's your mother? Where, you know, they really want to know. And a lot of people cannot provide, or anybody who cannot provide goes through a conversion. And today we have computers, so it's easier. There's a database. Back in the day, you lived in a community. How can a Jew live, even today, how can you live as a Jew, not in a community? So everybody knew basic business. I mean, you know, your own personal business, they might not know. But um, at least who you're, what, where you're from. Yeah? Um, believe it or not, all the Jewish people collectively converted at Mount Sinai. So the Erev Rav, the mixed multitudes, and the Jews, we all became equal, Jews together, okay? And now this particular mitzvah, you may not appoint a foreigner who is not one of your brothers. The previous part of the verse says you, you, should, you should be appointing one of your brothers over you, not a foreigner who's not your brother. So the, the instructions that we received at Sinai is that a convert cannot be appointed as a leader, not just as a king, as a leader in any area of authority. But their children can, as we notice that Ruth herself was a convert, her grandchild, David, became king. So it may be a restriction. A, sh- a, a person shouldn't convert thinking they're going to become a king. <laughs> they might be a prince like the rest of us but they're not going to become the king. And there's probably some deep-rooted psychological issues, perhaps even within the nation, to accept the authority of a foreigner. It might be very difficult. Okay? So there may be other practical reasons. You have a question. Yeah, but I I think it's not a question. It's just a comment. It really makes sense um, because um, it may really not be, how can I put it, somebody who has grown up in the community, in the culture, will better be more appropriate to lead than somebody who is coming from another uh, background. And of course, um, I, I think I what, can just. What you said, now you should know every rule always has its exceptions. So if somebody excels and exceeds, the, the rule could be pushed aside. Maybe not for a king, but in the general concept of appointing leaders. We had in our past, we had Shema Yev Av Talion, two great rabbis who were converts. And they became the leaders of the generation. Not just the leaders of the generation, you have to understand. In our book called Perkei Avot, that mentions the ethics of our fathers as the generations went on, Shema Yev Av Talion are listed. But we know that the pairs that are listed, one was the head of the court, and one was the prince, Ke'ilu, the king. When we didn't have kings, we had an exilarch. We were under the Babylonian rule, okay? So we had um, like a governor, so to speak. So a nasi, it's called. So Shmayev, I'll one was the head of the court, and one was the, the secular head, so to speak, like a king. And they were converts because they excelled. It, even though there's a rule, also we're going to see a woman you shouldn't appoint as a king. Because it says king, not queen. It says king. We don't have a mitzvah to appoint a queen. A queen will come as a result of being married to the king. She'll be queen. And maybe he'll die and she'll remain queen for a while. Who knows? And we had queens. And we had prophetess. We had women that excelled as prophets. So the general rule is not to uh, anoint them or appoint them, but there will always be exceptions. Okay? Okay.